Yeah, I need a special perspective. Just tell us about the top three risks or two risks which you worry about and and then how you're looking at, uh, you know, kind of recommending to this group, you know, as to uh, bring about solutions to uh, address them. Wow, actually, I, uh, Frank, I promise I'll do the last one. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I couldn't ask Frank to start. Okay, well, actually, just as Frank to speak, just out, out of my mind. First, I thank you to be here. And, uh, well, I think uh, one, one is um, how I got luxury. In fact, it was not I really wanted to be. I come from one of the, probably, you know, many of the, you already knew my story, I come from one of the largest uh, energy group, Tesla group, on like a source city gas or the major city gas operation, beside like a 25 companies my father built, from the old cars and the kit kind of joint venture, the industry gas, to, you know, one of the largest uh, land load, and the real estate owner as a private person. It's not the thing I want to emphasize, I always want to say, because I was women among six uh, children, and as a daughter, our duty was just to get married and a big family. That's how my journey started. So shall I go for another you know, kind of strategic marriage and a big family, carrying on you know, wealthy and powerful kind of uh, status in the society, or shall I pursue as a person before being a woman? Because I felt like I was so privileged to have such a family and good education. Why should I just marry the big family being subservient wife and uh, carrying keys and waiting for a husband for a big party leaving him? So I said, wow, my life is kind of crazy. So I decided to break off from the family tradition, which literally ended me kick out from the you know, the family heritage. It means that I was completely sold. I was that time in, in the United States studying. Maybe I was already westernized enough that and also learn about the women's liberation movement in America. So that was uh, in the eighties, nineteen eighties. So eventually since I didn't have any money at hand, since I kicked out from the family, so my first job happened to be working at Bloomingdale's and to learn fashion retailing. That's how I, I ended up running my own fashion business. In fact, uh, when I returned to Korea in 1990, there was very early stage of uh, opening up the market to luxury importation right after 1980 Olympic Games, you probably want to remember in Seoul. And I was one of the deep pioneer and uh, bringing like major European brands, including Gucci, Sonia Gibson, and even major amounts and Spencer, and MCM, which is German leather handbag brand, as a licensee. And uh, obviously, Asian market is one of the largest market Yes, I'm mean, sorry. So Asian market is one of the, uh, you know, one of the most striving market for luxury demands. And uh, but um, uh, obviously Asia faced also Asian financial crisis in 1998. Now it seems like Europe is not facing now. And um, um, well, I did quite a uh, successful M&A um, with the Gucci. That's why I got some good money back and risked my company. So I have a lot of synthesis what's going on these days here too. But uh, I didn't really get discouraged. I thought maybe this is a good way to consolidate my you know, uh, kind of platform there as a small medium uh, company owner and uh, learn some good skill set from major uh, luxury brand. They have a ex ex quite extensive knowledge how to run merchandise marketing and really branding power building. You know, still I feel like many of these luxury business striving because of a, a like the, the emerging China market and also maybe in Russia and not some other emerging uh, countries around the world. So eventually, I uh, instead of getting discouraged, I decided to really go for uh, acquiring the brand, which is MCM, which I did in 2005. And uh, that was another new venture because before that I was very much confined in a small South Korean market but decided to go for global market, which is a very brave move because I never really been out there. And uh, even taking care of one country at a small medium country on a, in not easy. I go for global marketing as a different region, different culture, a different you know, distance management, and logistics or the supply chain management, a lot of things need to take care of. So since I acquired the brand and <coughs> last six years journey, I must confess it was really great pain and agony. However, I think my team did a good job. We have already six hundred people and up from fifty different countries, nine offices around the world. 
and we have uh, already more than 110,000 uh, stores, uh, not only in Asia, but in Korea, and uh, China, but also Europe and the United States, and this is open also in Dubai. And also, we also have almost 200 wholesale accounts from our work in 30 countries. So how did I do that? I mean, I know, still I don't know how I got there, but uh, one thing is now companies, this is probably we are doing more than uh, 450 million dollar business. So is that this uh, current economic risk uh, affected us, of course, because obviously Europe, um, I knew some ways, uh, before even I knew that such a financial crisis would uh, occur in European market, but uh, the, the emerging market has a great demand for luxury. So my uh, my uh, first job when I took up the uh, MCM was uh, restructuring the brand. It means that instead of the extensive operation in Europe, I consolidate from three offices into one office. One office. And also secondly, uh, we really focus on more, let's say, um, merchandise and branding kind of strategy instead of um, uh, really um, leaving so many uh, distribution accounts around Europe, which take a lot of our resources as well. Therefore, I think we did quite a successful structure in Europe, and mainly we really try to concentrate on building up our business in China from the three years ago. Now we have already 20, almost getting 20 stores in China. Next five years, we plan to open 100 stores. Probably even Korea and China put together two countries, we expect in five years to have billions of dollars. Let me ask you a question. I mean, with this kind of an expansion, so what? What could go wrong? You know, what do you worry about? I mean, what would and, and that's that's the key question. So, what are the, the risks which can hit your business as you look at uh, you know the current environment? So, this that would be very very real for us. Well, okay. So, one is I feel probably um, um, for me the is a growing pain is I must say the supply chain management because um, as I said as small media company just a, a not like as very much a good group, but in fact in markets such as like China. We are competing the same level and the same speed. And uh, they have uh, just uh, dominated everything from the human resource point of view, all the creative, they just uh, brought through the money, and uh, also all the marketing and PR network, they are like a mafia network, you just cannot get even with a few million dollars. So, 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 how do you, how, so how do you do risk against that? So what, so what, what we do is uh, uh, potentially like this. One is um, I just try to maximize my strength in that playing field. One. Being as an Asian company, instead, even though our headquarters here, holding company in Zurich, and also we have an office in, uh, in uh, Germany, however, we try to enhance our business center in Asia. So, to so try to really maximize short distance management, it means that any like uh, demands come from Asian, uh, the, the Asian market or China market, in 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 in, 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 in immediate, we can just move every goods within one day. Second, what we did was um, really obvious. We really uh, even creative side, most creative talents are here in Europe, I must say. However. As some Asian design team know Asian did quite well, so we just try to maximize our talents who has that strength there. Third is like they, even we don't have half billion dollars to spend like other big luxury brands are doing on PR and the advertising activities, but what we do is we really try to mobilize social intent media. And also, interesting is that the market in Asia very young targeted. But often in Asia, in Europe, Majority uh, consumers are more mature, so I think we really try to stand our strength. So coming back to you know just kind of switching gear from risk to inclusive growth. So as a luxury brand owner, you know how do you think you can propagate what I call inclusive growth? And and you know somehow luxury and, and inclusive growth somehow don't go well together in many ways in traditional ways of thinking. But is the, is your company is your firm? You know, uh, thinking about sustainability and, and uh, inclusive growth, and, and, and uh, what's your point of view there? I think this is, a, I shouldn't be biased, but uh, you know, since I brought up in very male dominated society, obviously, instead of being a discussion as a women, obviously, all the business leaders do, normally, like a, a lot of heavy drinkings and geisha parties. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I really try to really focus on because I'm more mission driven than money driven. So it means that first of all, I, I think my mission was first, I really try to see how this half of population women can prove, can take on more responsible 
and a job in economic and political and social in general. And so that's why I didn't strike for a second mission being really fighting against corruption. Because it was rather some of the stupid things to be being a part as a woman already handicapped that I carried up with handicap. But I feel as a woman <coughs> as a mother of child and I feel we have a duty to inherit better you know, society in the future. So fighting against corruption made made me and my team much more clever, much more faster, and much more Accurately means that we were one of the first adapter of uh, like the IT system in our own uh, post, and uh, now we are using the SAP internal world around the, in a, a, a global uh, um, the operation now. So the third is I think also now, as I mentioned before, as a small medium company because Korea maybe some other countries too often dominate either general conglomerate or even global scale wise those multinational corporation you cannot compete as a small company so you don't have the resource. But I feel, as I said, we can really clever to go into niche and also if we utilize this kind of social media and sure. network, I think we can very powerful. Uh, this, is, this is a nice segue, you know, talking about.